Welcome, and in this session, we're going to be doing Matthew chapter 26. We're going to read through it. I'm going to comment as I go. This is an awesome chapter. This is a, it starts out with the plot against Jesus. It goes into when Jesus was anointed with the very, very expensive perfume, the alabaster jar of ointment. Goes into uh, talking about Judas, who betrays Jesus. Also goes into the Last Supper. And we talk about Gethsemane, and it's a very interesting thing I got to share with you about Gethsemane. So uh, let's start off here with verse 1. This is Matthew chapter 26, verse 1. When Jesus had finished all these words, again, let's just not skip over this without actually getting into exactly what it says here. We just finished reading Matthew chapter 24 and Matthew chapter 25. Matthew chapter 24, and I know many of you know, is the chapter about the end times, about the last days, about the second coming of uh, of Jesus, okay? So Jesus went through the whole thing about Ma about his second coming, about the end of the age, about the future events, about wars and pestilences and all the things that are become, uh, coming on the earth that are going to be very, very... Uh, terrible judgments upon the earth. And then he goes into Matthew chapter 25, which really goes right into Judgment Day. So he doesn't just stop at the last days. He doesn't just stop with, you know, the um, the end times, but he goes past the end times into Judgment Day on, you know, in Matthew chapter 25. So if you haven't listened to Matthew 24, Matthew 25, please do. So when Jesus had finished all these words, he said to his disciples, you know that after two days, the Passover is coming and the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. You see, now Jesus was looking forward to the Passover and uh, he was only two days away. So very, very interesting here um, to understand how Jesus perceived this, this whole event. Okay, verse, the, verse 3, Then the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders of the people were gathered together in the court of the high priest, who was called Caiaphas. Very interesting that um, they claim to have found some ancient uh, artifacts or ancient um, uh, things in, in the Holy Land that uh, actually had the name Caiaphas inscribed on it. Uh, ancient relics, that's the word I'm looking for. Verse 4, they took counsel against... Uh, they took counsel together. This reminds me of what it says in Psalms about them taking, account, taking counsel against the Lord, right? They took counsel together and uh, that they might take Jesus, which his original Hebrew name is Yeshua, by deceit. Oh my. Now, why would the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people be talking about deceit here? Isn't that against the law of God? Hmm. And Jesus said they're all hypocrites, right? They're, they were so desperate to condemn Jesus to death that they're looking for Lies. They're looking for lies. They're looking for something that would stick. So, uh, yeah, verse 4 again. They took counsel together that they might take Jesus by deceit and kill him. But they said, not during the feast, lest a riot occur among the people. So they feared the people. You know, they feared the people. It seems like they feared the people more than they feared God. Verse 6. Now, when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, this is kind of like, meanwhile, uh, while Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, a woman came to him having an alabaster jar, very expensive ointment. Now, I've read in other places that this ointment, this ointment, which was a perfume, was extremely, extremely expensive. And actually, there is a, a part in some of the, the New Testament, so-called Apocrypha, that talks about what the origins of this ointment was, which is, you know, actually very interesting. We're going to get into this. We're going to get into all that later. So stick around. Um, yeah. Uh, make sure you subscribe if you haven't subscribed uh, and check back all the time for new videos. So uh, this very expensive ointment was thousands upon thousands of dollars. Uh, some would even say that it, they would, it, it could go into the millions. This is very, this is like the most expensive ointment in the world. Okay, just that alabaster jar. And this woman just took that jar and just poured it over, over Jesus' head as he sat at the table. Verse 8, but when his disciples saw this, they were indignant. They were angry. Now, in another gospel, we got a little bit more detail. And it, it says that especially 
Judas. Judas was the one that was more angry than anybody else. And it said why. Because Judas was the treasurer of all of them. You know, Jesus and the 12 disciples. He was the treasurer. And uh, he was also a thief. He would dip his, he would, uh, he would take his cut, okay, and then some. So uh, he was very, very, you know, angry, uh, according to, uh, you know, one of the other gospels. We're going to get to that. But, you know, again, looking at it in perspective, he was the one that was more angry than any of them. Okay. Why, the, why this waste? For this ointment may, might have been sold for much and given to the poor. You could, you know, hey, I mean, you could, you could um, supply the food or the, you know, the resources, the shelter, you, you supply the needs of poor people. For, how many poor people for all their life? with the money that we could have got from this and it was just dumped over your head, Jesus. However, Jesus knowing this, excuse me, however, knowing this, Jesus said to them, why do you trouble the woman? She has done a, she has done a good work for me. For you always have the poor with you, but you don't always have me. So look at this is a very special occasion he's saying more or less okay this is a special special occasion you have the lord of glory sitting before you and you don't you won't always have him sitting at the table so you always have the poor the poor, the poor are, they're always out there but the lord right now is right with you and it's time it's his time verse 12 for in pouring this ointment on my body she did it to prepare me for burial. Wow. This was her, it sounds like this was her, her purpose, her motive. Jesus, you're going to die. And you said you're going to die. We're gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start preparing you for burial right now. You know. Verse 13, most certainly I tell you, what, wherever this good news, this gospel is preached in all the world, what this woman has done will also be spoken of her as a memorial of her. Very interesting how the scriptures say in many places throughout the scriptures, and, and then some, okay, through the, you know, from Genesis to Revelation and through the Apocryphas and everything else, it talks a lot about memorials, okay? How if you do something special for God or you do something special, especially for the poor, uh, a memorial, uh, it, it could come up as a memorial before God. We see that even in the, in the book of Acts, okay? Uh, how the giving alms to the poor could, you know, it, it's basically, you know, not that you do it for this, but it can get, it, get, it can, excuse me, it can get God's attention more than just anything. Uh, it really gets God's attention. It causes him to take notice. Look at this. This person is not just fasting and praying, but this person is also giving of his own substance to someone else that needs it more than him. I'm noticing. You know, like, they're, because of that, their prayers come up as a memorial for the Lord. So Jesus knew this. And in this context, in the, in the, uh, the Apocrypha existed back in those days, was actually in the Septuagint back in those days, you know, plus other books as well. And not just the Septuagint, but other books as well, um, that uh, is, is called the Apocrypha. Jesus knew it all. And he knew the whole context of you give to the poor, it will, it, will come up, it will come up as a memorial for you. Okay, That's what it says previous to the writing of the book of Matthew here. Okay, That's the whole idea. You give alms and it can come up as a memorial before the Lord. Uh, and your prayers could be, you know, given priority treatment, okay? Like, uh, you know, prior, uh, you know, express mail, <laughs> you know, because God notices your selflessness and uh, notices how you give and how you sacrifice of yourself for other people, and that gets its attention. And uh, and and that could be, uh, you know, He would honor your works and your your prayers, especially because of that. So Jesus knew this whole thing, this whole paradigm of giving to the poor a memorial giving to the poor a memorial before god uh, giving to the poor a more a memorial before god so he said listen right now uh 
you always have the poor with you, but right now this very, very expensive ointment was poured out upon me to prepare me for my burial. And then he goes into explaining how this would be a memorial. So he was saying, look, it, okay, I know you guys are talking about alms and giving to the poor and this, and we know, everybody knows about how that comes up as a memorial and, and that kind of thing. But he says, listen, this, I'm basically likening this to giving of alms. Just because she poured it out on my head doesn't mean that she loses her memorial because she didn't give it to the poor. No, she still gets her memorial. You know, that's what he was saying. For those of you who know the Apocrypha, those of you who know the other scriptures of the Bible, I'm not talking about just the Apocrypha. I'm talking about everything uh, throughout the, and we're going to go through it. We're going to go through it word for word. Those of you who know your stuff, you know what I'm talking about. Okay. Verse 14. Then one of the 12, who is called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests. Okay, let me stop there just for a second. Because you see, this apparently is the straw that broke the camel's back. This is a straw that broke the camel's back in the, in the mind of Judas. He's like, I could have gotten lots of money here. I could have gotten my cut. I could have, I could have really dipped my hand in, dipped my, my little kleptomaniac hands in there and taken a lot of money from this. I lost that money. Ooh, what kind of, you know, what kind of rabbi am I following here? What kind of guy, you know, what kind of rabbi? And by the way, back in those days, and even today, every rabbi has their disciples. So it wasn't unusual for Jesus to have 12 disciples. It wasn't. So, and we're going to read this also, you know, also later on as well, uh, in, uh, in later on in the, uh, in the New Testament, so-called New Testament. So Judas Iscariot was, it just pushed him over the edge to see this. His eyes were on the money. It, it, it caused, this is what caused him to snap. This is what pushed him over the edge. So then after that, he's like, that's it. I'm going to go. I'm going to, I'm going to go to the chief priests and I'm going to tip them off. Verse 15. And he said, what are you willing to give me if I deliver him to you? Listen, I'm part of the inner crowd. I know where he is. I know where he travels. I can tell you how to get to him. I know. So they weighed out for him 30 pieces of silver. From that time, he sought opportunity to betray him. He's thinking about, he's got his, his mind on the money. Verse 17, now on the first day of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Yeshua saying to him, where do you want us to prepare the Passover, prepare for you to eat the Passover? Now, a lot of people believe that Jesus did not eat the actual Passover and the, and the Last Supper was not a Passover supper. Jesus didn't eat the Passover. Jesus, he, he missed out on that. This would have been the perfect time for Jesus to say, oh, don't worry about the Passover, guys. Um, it's not going to happen this year. This would have been the perfect time for him to say that. But no, that's not what he said. Verse 18, he said, go into the city to a certain person and tell him, the teacher, the rabbi says... My time is at hand. My time is near. I'm I'm about ready to die. I will keep the pa- I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Hmm. Clear statement. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Verse 19. The disciples did as Jesus Jesus commanded them, and they prepared the Passover. So if it was if it's true that Jesus didn't really eat the Passover, why did why would he tell them to prepare for it? And why would he said, "I will eat it with my with my with my disciples"? He did eat it. Verse twenty. Now, when evening had come, he was reclining at the table with the twelve disciples. As they were eating, he said, "Most certainly, I tell you that one of you will, be, will betray me." They were exceedingly sorrowful, and each began to ask him, It isn't me, is it, Lord? He answered, He who dipped his hand with me in the dish will betray me. The Son of Man goes, even as it is written of him, but woe to to that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Wow. What a huge... I mean, again, woe, 
sorrow, ca calling sorrow, calling curses down. This is the loving Jesus, the forgiving, the tree-hugging Jesus that everybody thinks that he was. And he wasn't. Okay? He cursed individuals, groups of people, and even entire cities. He called down woe to them. Sorrow, not blessing. It's the opposite of blessing. It's a woe. Woe to that man through whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Oh. That is a heavy statement. Jesus didn't even say that about anybody else. I mean, he had some, you know, he had some pretty hard words to say some, to some people. But this is pretty tough. It would be better for that man if he, if he had not been born. He could have said, he could have said, oh, well, I know the guy, I mean, the guy who betrays me, you know, I love him. I'll forgive him. You know, um, I know that he made, him, he made a mistake and, you know, he'll be, he'll be, you know, he'll repent afterwards and, and I'll accept him and don't worry about it. I, I'm a loving guy. I just love everybody. It's not what he said. Not. N-O-T. <laughs> not. Woe to that man. Sorrow, cursing, the opposite of blessing. It would be better for that man if he had not been born. Ew. Verse 25, Judas, who betrayed him, answered, It isn't me, is it, Rabbi? He said to him, You said it. Yep, yep. In other words, You said it, buddy. You got it. Verse 26. As they were eating, Jesus took bread, gave thanks for it, or some translations say blessed or uh, gave thanks for, and broke it. Now, I often wonder if Jesus said the same kind of traditional Jewish blessing as they do today. You know, Baruch Atah Adonai, Eloheinu Melech HaAlam, Hamotzi Lechem, Min Aretz. Did he say that? Maybe. Maybe the Jews preserved it for the low these many years. He gave to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. <gasps> this is my body? And we're not supposed to be cannibals. This is against the law of God. They knew what he was talking about. He took the cup, gave thanks. Again, I wonder if he did what the Jews do today where they go, Baruch atah Adonai, Eloheinu melech ha'olam, Bore pri ha'gafen, Amen. So I wonder if it was like that. I wonder if he blessed the Lord for the fruit of the vine just the way they do today. I wonder if they really did preserve it all the way down the line. So he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave to them, and he said, All of you drink it, for this is my blood of the new covenant. New Covenant. There are two words in the uh, in the original Greek manuscripts, both translated "new." Okay, both translated "new" in the English. Now, this is what makes it very uh, what would I say confusing. Okay, we get our English word "new" actually from one of those Greek words, which is neos, N-E-O-S. And this is where we get our name. This is where I, excuse me, this is where we get our uh, our word in the English word new from, okay? So that means brand new, brand new, just like how we use it today, new. Um, but there is another word in the Greek manuscripts uh, that is also translated new, and uh, it is not naos, okay? It doesn't mean brand spanking new, okay? It can in a way, but it doesn't necessarily, it can mean refreshed, renewed, re I mean refurbished. It's called kainos, kainos, okay? So, Really, when we say New Testament, most people understand it to be a naos new. Naos. But that's not what he said here. 
That's not the word that he used. He word, he used the word kainos, which means and could signify that it's a test, it's a covenant that existed, that has already been in, in, in force, is already in existence, but just refreshed, renewed. Put it this way. When Jesus said, I give you a new commandment to love one another, those of you who know your stuff know that love is not a new commandment. It is in the books of Moses, book way back in the in the in the Torah, way back in Exodus and Leviticus, way 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 back. It's all command to love one another is commanded there. So when Jesus said, "I give you a new command to love one another," he said he wasn't talking about a brand new commandment, but rather a renewed. Like I, I, I more or less like this. I want to refresh it in your mind. I want to I want to give you. Uh, I want to. I just want to refresh it in your mind. I, I want to remind you of this. I want to. I want to make it fresh. I want to re- revive it in your mind. Okay, so that is what Jesus meant here when he said "new covenant," not a brand new covenant, but a but a renewed covenant or revived covenant. Okay, I want to make it fresh and I want to make it more, bring it to life again in your in your in your lives. Okay, for this is the blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for the for for many for the remission of sins. And this is what a lot of people don't understand, don't really get. They don't understand how the blood works. Okay, they think it's some magical thing where it's like, well, the blood of Jesus just somehow covers my sin. That's not how it works. John the Baptist, he was the one that introduced the world to Jesus. Okay, behold, look. This is the, the, the Lamb of God. And, you know, of course, they're thinking about the Lamb as in the blood of the Lamb, the Lamb sacrifice. This is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Not covers the sin of the world, but takes it away. How does this work, you would say? Now, let me just give you a really quick crash, crash course here because we're right here. We're talking about the new covenant. We're talking about the blood. We, I need to say this. When when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, nobody said, What do you mean, John? What do you mean? Okay. There was many other times in the scriptures where, you know, things were said and they were said, What do you mean here? What do you mean there? What's that mean? Lord, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? But not there. Why did not why didn't anybody ask John the Baptist what he meant by this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Why? Because they were all Jewish. John was Jewish. Jesus was Jewish. Yeshua, Yehokanan, Jesus and John. Everybody was Jewish. They all grew up in the Jewish culture. They all grew up in a Torah culture. They all knew from little what it meant and what it entailed, what the Lamb of God sacrifice entailed, which most Christians today do not understand. Even today, Go and ask or do some research if you want. Go and ask a Jewish rabbi. It doesn't have to be a messianic, you know, believing in Yeshua. Because this is talking, we want to ask them about, we we want to know about the lamb sacrifice in the Torah, okay? So, so it doesn't, you can ask an Orthodox Jewish rabbi that's even non-messianic, okay? And he will tell you, trust me, he will tell you. If he knows this stuff, he will tell you how it works. You got somebody who, is in sin, his, who is bound in some sin. He cannot repent, okay? Remember, you know, according to Ezekiel chapter 18, according to everything through the Torah and everything like that, when you repent, you're eligible to apply, more or less, for forgiveness, okay? If you have not repented, forget about asking for forgiveness. You got to repent first. Repenting is not feeling sorry. Repenting is not crying. Remember, in the book of Hebrews, we, we read about Esau, who in tears sought repentance, but even with all of his tears that he cried out and his sorrow that he went through, he did not get repentance. What is repentance? Repentance is actual change, real world change in your life. Change the way you think, change the way you live, change the way you view sin. You used to be a sinner, now you aren't. You used to be a you know kleptomaniac, now you're not. You used to be an alcoholic, now you're not. You know, you used to be 
whatever. You used to, you used to be bound with, with some drugs. Now you're not. You used to sin, but now you don't. You have removed the plank out of your eye. But what about those who need extra help? They cannot repent or they find it very hard to. So the idea was you go get your, your, your animal sacrifice. You take it to the temple. The, the priest examines it to make sure that it's, that it's kosher. You know, there's no spot on it, no blemish on it. And then it's, it, you know, assuming that it's accepted, that person who is caught in a sin, caught up in the web of sin, watches the priest slaughter that, that lamb, watches the peace, priest slaughter that lamb. And as the blood flows, that person who was caught in the web of sin looks at that blood and says, there goes the life of my sin. As that lamb dies, there goes the life of my sin. He, he identifies with that lamb as it, as it is as if it is his own sin and sinful nature. As the lamb, again, this is Jewish perspective now, as they took the fat of that lamb and burned it on the altar, that person is supposed to look at that and say, as that fat burns, there goes the passion and lust for sin, burned away, burned up. And so the whole idea of animal sacrifice was to make it a catalyst to repentance. That's why many times throughout the scriptures, God said, you know what? Forget your sacrifices. I don't want your sacrifice. It's like, you know, sacrificing a lamb is like breaking a dog's neck as far as I'm concerned or whatever, okay? Because, you know, the sacrifices of God are, 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 are broken heart and a contrite spirit. And the sacrifices of you know, bulls and goats, you don't want. Like, I, I desire obedience, not sacrifice. To obey is better than sacrifice. All of these scriptures, there's more and more we can quote. We can go on and on and on and on where God said over and over and over again, listen, guys, I don't want your sacrifice. I want your repentance. You don't understand the purpose of sacrifices. You think that I just want sacrifices? And if you bring sacrifices without really connecting to it, without repenting, without really making a change in your life, that's not what I want. That's not what I want. That's not, you totally missed the, you totally missed the, the point. That's what God was saying, Okay. So, that's why Paul knew this very clearly. Galatians chapter 2, Galatians chapter 5, Galatians 2.20. I am crucified with Christ. You're supposed to identify with that sacrifice. When that sacrifice dies, I die with it. For, uh, Galatians 5 verse 24. Those who belong to Jesus, those who belong to the Messiah, those who belong to the Lord, have have crucified their sinful nature with its passions and desires. It all goes back to the lamb. It all goes back to the, what it really means. What it really means to, uh, you know, in, in scripturally speaking, Torah speaking, what was the purpose and the function? How did it work? That's how the blood purchased remissions of, remission of sins because as you looked at Jesus dying, you say, I die with him. I am crucified with Christ. And we know a dead man does not sin. Paul said in, in Romans chapter 6, how can you who are dead to sin live in it any longer? Uh, uh, Paul said in Colossians, uh, I believe it's chapter 2, where he was talking about you die to sin by the sacrifice of Jesus. When Jesus was sacrificed, you're sent, you by faith you connect with that and you say, my sin dies. I am baptized into his death. Okay, and being born again is when you're baptized fully into his death. All of the old, all of the sinful nature, all of the old, all the dark, all the darkness is dead, gone, removed from your life and you rise again in newness of life with him just as Jesus rose from the dead, living in righteousness according to the law of God Flaw, like without effort because you're living by the Spirit now. So that's how it works, guys. That's how it works. That's how the blood poured out for the actually purchases, so to speak, the remissions of sins. The remission of sins by giving you a catalyst to repentance. It's all about repentance, guys. All about repentance. 
first thing Jesus said. It's the last thing he said to his church. It's the first thing the disciples said. It's, it's throughout the book of Acts. It's everywhere. Everywhere. From Genesis to Revelation and then beyond. Verse 29. But I tell you that I will not drink of this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it anew with you in my Father's kingdom. Here's another one. I need to stop here and tell you. Um, a lot of people believe that Jesus drank alcoholic wine. Okay? There is a thing in the Torah, in the book of Numbers, called the vow of the Nazarite. Okay? This is how it worked. If you want to be holy, you obey God's law. God said it's easy to obey in, in Deuteronomy chapter 30. You don't have to climb all the way up to heaven to do it. You don't have to dig down to the core of the earth to get it. It's right there. It's within your reach. That's why Jesus preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The kingdom of heaven, meaning his rule and reign over your life, where you obey his rule, you obey his rules. He's your king. He's got rules. A king doesn't rule without rules. <laughs> so those of you who wanted to be holy, you live by the law of God. But there's a little ex if you want it, if you want it like a boot turbo boost, if you want nitro boost there. You go for the Nazarite vow, okay? That is like the ultimate, okay? It's not necessarily required by anybody, by everybody, or for everybody. Um, but it is, you know, a lot of people it's optional. Some people might be required. Like we look at Samson, you look at uh, John the Baptist, it seems like it was required for them, you know, from, from, from the womb. Um, but uh, it's optional, uh, generally speaking. So it's, it's like the extra degree of holiness. You can't, you know, you can't, a part of the Nazarite vow is you can't drink anything from grapes, grape juice, or even grape, can't eat grapes, nothing like that, okay? I believe that Jesus was under the Nazarite vow. I believe that he fulfilled that in the sense that he obeyed it. Why wouldn't he? He's the, if, if he's the holiest man that ever lived, why would he not go by the holiest vow? I mean, why would John the Baptist be more holy and more strict in his following of God's law than Jesus? doesn't make any sense. Jesus is the Lamb of God, the Son of God, that is the blameless, spotless Lamb of God. Um, sinless Lamb of God. So if there's anybody that would be sinning between John and Jesus, it probably would have been John, if anybody. Um, so Jesus would be the more holy figure. So he should have, I believe he did, follow the Nazarite vow all of his life. And that's one of the stipulations of the Nazarite vow is that you don't cut your hair either. And this is this could also... Uh, account for the reasons why that all of the ancient um you know the ancient accounts of his appearance and even to this day most people think of jesus with having long hair again that's probably because of the nazarite vow he did not there's no evidence anywhere in scripture evidence that he actually drank anything of the, of of grapes at all be informed that there are there's one word in the, in the Greek, which means both fresh grape juice and also fermented grape juice, okay? The only difference between the two is the age of it, okay? So one word means this is the same. When you say wine, you got to look at the context to know whether or not it's fresh grape juice or aged fermented alcoholic stuff, okay? I know Jesus said that John came and he was... Um, you know that he wasn't. Uh, he came uh, fasting and and uh, um, all this kind of stuff. And you said that he had a demon, but the Son of Man came, quote unquote, so to speak, eating and drinking. Um, and you call him a drunkard and a wine bibber and a friend of sinners and all this kind of stuff. All this stuff is false. Jesus wasn't a glutton. Jesus wasn't a drunkard. There's no evidence anywhere. You know. I know he said that he came eating and drinking, but that's just a, really that's just a, a, a figure of speech, you know. 
figure of speech. He, there's no evidence anywhere he actually sat down and had a drink with anybody. And here when he had an opportunity, he passed it up. He said, I will not drink of this fruit of the vine. Verse 29. He refused to drink of it. Why? I believe it's because he was under the Nazarite vow and he stuck to it all the way through to his death. That's why he said, I'm not going to drink it until maybe the day, maybe later on in, in the Father's kingdom, some day in the future somewhere. Verse 30. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble. Again, the word stumble here means to fall away or to sin. Because of me tonight. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. And that's in Zechariah verse, chapter 13, verse 9. But after I am raised up, I will go before you into Galilee. So he says very clearly here, he will be raised. Again, you got to wonder why, how the disciples didn't get it. Even right up and even after the fact, they didn't, they didn't get it. Even today, so many Christians, you tell them what the Bible says. You tell them what the scriptures say. You tell them the facts, the truth. And they still, still over their head. Many. Uh, verse 33. But Peter answered them, answered him, even if all will be made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble. Oh, I'm just, I'll never do that for, uh, you know, against you, Lord. Jesus said to him, most certainly I tell you that tonight before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. <gasps> Peter said, even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all of the disciples said likewise. Peter was just a little bit, he's always the first one to just kind of jump in and speak up. He's always like the one to walk on the water, the one to get to the tomb, the one to say you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the one that says this. Uh, he's always sticking his foot in there first, right? Verse uh, 36. Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane. This is a very interesting uh, word here. The word Gethsemane means olive press. It's a place where they produce olive oil. And we know in the scriptures, oil is symbolic of the anointing or you know, the anointing oil. The word Christ which means Messiah, Mashiach in the Hebrew, means anointed one. So you can't get oil without being pressed. There's got to be a pressing. There's got to be a crushing before you get the good oil, the goodness out of it. It's like, you know, you hear about even today, in, for example, with garlic. They say, don't slice garlic crush it because you get the that's what produces the goodness in the garlic the, it produces it's like a chemical reaction in it that produces the real good stuff that's really good for your body but if you just slice it it doesn't it's not that good for you you got to crush it to get the good stuff out of it and that's what happened here at Gethsemane you had to be crushed in order to get the oil the beautiful anointing oil for the anointed one so he came with him to a place called Gethsemane and said to his disciples, Sit here while I go there and pray. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. Peter, James, and John. Peter, Yaakov, and Yochanan. Well, we know that James, his real name was Jacob or Yaakov. Peter, James, and John. Notice, Peter, James, and John always has the inner circles. Always, he's, they always got the inner scoop. They, they always got the exclusive access in all of these very premium settings, premium events in the Lord. That's why I say, when you read the scriptures, read the words in red, read Peter, James, and John. Read the works of Peter, James, and John before you read anything else. Get them down. Get it memorized before you read anything else. Because if you read, let's say, for, the, for example, the letters of Paul first, and you know the letters of Paul more than you know the, the letters of Peter, James, and John, you could easily misunderstand things and get things mi mixed up. Even Peter warned people about that. You know, he said, Paul writes things that are hard to understand. Listen, if Peter said they're hard to understand, and he said that in 2 Peter chapter 3, he said, it's hard to understand. If they're hard to understand, if Peter says they're hard to understand, like this is a genius in the world of Christianity. Peter, I mean, this is Peter. If he said it, you better believe that it's hard to understand. 
if it was hard to understand for those guys in that culture, in that day, how much more harder it is for us to understand 2,000 years removed from the fact in a different culture, in a different nation, Peter said it's hard to understand and many people twist it to their own destruction. And he said that in the context of talking about being sinless and spotless, okay? He said, be sinless and spotless. And, you know, uh, then he went into Paul saying the stuff that he writes is hard to understand and people misunderstand it and twist it to their own destruction. How? Because they use that to somehow justify their, their sin, their spots. Don't do it. So verse 37, he took with him Peter, James, and John, and he began to be sorrowful and severely troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. He went, a little fur- he went forward a little, fell on his face and prayed, saying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. What's he talking about? The cup of death, the cup of crucifixion, the cup of humility a cup of darkness, a cup of suffering. You got to understand the crucifixion was very, very, very brutal. One of the most brutal, one of the most painful form, forms of, of execution that's ever been. You know, just to whip someone so badly that their skin is torn off of them and then they're just hanging there like a piece of meat just hung, just completely naked, Sometimes these people were beaten so bad you, would, you, you couldn't even recognize that it was who it was. Blood and just ripped apart. They were just ripped. They use a Roman cat and nine tails that um, some people believe that uh, had nine whips in one. And each on the end of each one of these whips was pieces of bone or glass or something that would cut and dig and just, just make them make a mess of your, just totally just lacerate your skin. And they did that to, to Jesus. No wonder he said, Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not what I desire, but what you desire. He came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, what? Couldn't you watch with me for one hour? Watch and pray that you don't, that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Excuse me. You are willing. You are willing. You are willing to do this, but you can't because you're too tired. Your, your body just can't, just can't take it. Verse 42, again, a second time, he went away and prayed, saying, My father, if this cup can't pass away from me unless I drink it, your desire be done. Your will be done. He came again and found them sleeping. Can you imagine in the most toughest, darkest, most serious time in your life, you got nobody there? Nobody? You're all alone. All alone. When you're faced with this kind of thing, all alone. They were sleeping. He found them again and he left them again, excuse me, in verse 44, went away and prayed a third time saying the same words. Then he came to his disciples and said to them, are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Arise, let's be going. Behold, he who betrays me is at hand. Again, the phrase at hand means near, close. The hour is close. I mean, the hour meaning the moment. The, the, the time is very, very near. I'm, 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 going to be, I'm going to be arrested. Very close. It says here, verse 40, uh, 47, While he was still speaking, behold, Judas, one of the twelve, came and with a great multitude... With him a great multitude with swords and clubs from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now he who betrayed him had given them a sign, saying, Whomever I kiss, he's the one. Seize him. Oh, see? How sweet. 
a lot of times you got to watch out for the people who smile so much and shake your hand and always is so overly sweet with you. Look out. Watch out. Sometimes the ones you can trust more are the ones that really just tell you like it is. Tell you the truth even when it hurts. Doesn't don't doesn't always give you the butterflies, you know what I mean? Verse 48. Now he who betrayed him had given him a sign um, saying, whoever I kiss, Mwah! oh, I want to kiss him. He's the one, sees him. How, how deceitful is that, is it? Is it, is it uh, isn't that deceitful? Verse 49, immediately he came to Jesus and said, greetings, rabbi, and kissed him. Jesus said to him, friend, why are you here? Then they came and laid hands on Jesus and took him. They arrested him. Behold, one of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Then Jesus said to him, Put your sword back into its place, for all those who take the sword will die by the sword. I often think about this when I see anything on the news about people who are, you know, there's like a shooting or whatever and they get shot too. You know, the shooter gets shot. You know, those who take the sword will die by the sword. Verse 53. Or do you think that I couldn't ask my father and he would even now send me more than 12 legions of angels? In other words, Jesus said, you don't understand. You know, I don't need a sword. I don't need anybody to fight for me. Because I could call right now for the, for the father and would send for me more than 12 legions of angels. And I, I understand a legion is at least a thousand. So at least 12,000 angels or more. How many do you need? In the book of Revelation, we have only one angel. Only one angel. How many angels did it take to, to bind up the devil and cast him into the lake of fire? Only one. Only one angel did it. But Jesus said he had at his disposal more than 12 legions of angels. Wow. How then would the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? So again, Jesus made it very clear. This is something that just, it, it's, it was on the schedule. It has to be done. Verse 55, in that hour, Jesus said to the multitudes, have you come out as, a, as against a robber with swords and clubs to seize me? I sat daily in the temple teaching and you didn't arrest me. But all this has happened that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples left him and fled, took off. Let's get out of here, guys. Let's get out of here. Those who had taken Jesus led him away to Caiaphas, the high priest, where the scribes and the elders were gathered together. They were waiting for him. But Peter followed him from a distance to the court of the high priest and entered in and sat at, with the officers to see the end. I want to see what's going on. I want to see what's going on with Jesus here. Now the chief priests, the elders, and the whole council sought, sought false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. Again, what in the world are they doing? Chief priests, elders, these are the people that are supposed to be holy. They're seeking false testimony? They're seeking false witnesses against Torah? Well, they were against Torah because they were staring him right in the face. He was the Torah personified. The Torah, the very Torah that says, you shall not have, you shall not bear false witness. That is the one that they were staring at. Jesus was the human, he was the human form of the Torah. The scriptures, the Tanakh, the Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. And they found none. They found no false witnesses. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. But at last, two false witnesses came forward and they said, this man said, I'm able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. Now, why did this false, these false witnesses stick? Because actually Jesus did say this, but they misunderstood him to mean the actual temple building. But Jesus was talking about his body, the temple. So that's the thing. It was that's what made the stick. It was kind of like a half truth. It was like, yes, he did say that, but no, that's not what he meant. 
you know, a lot of times the half-truths are the worst lies, right? Uh, chapter, uh, excuse me, verse 62, the high priest stood up and said to him, have you no answer? What is this that, that these testify against you? But Jesus stayed silent. As it says in the scriptures, like a sheep led to the slaughter is silent. The high priest answered him and said, I adjure you. I order you by the, na- by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Mashiach, the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus said to him, you have said so. Nevertheless, I tell you that after this, you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of the sky. Then the high priest tore his clothes. Now, again, why didn't they say, what do you mean, Jesus? They all knew what he meant. They all knew what he was talking about when he said, Son of Man, at the right hand of the power, coming in the clouds. Why? Because this was in their scriptures. This was in the book of Enoch, which we know existed and was known and read and taught as doctrine in those days. How do we know that? Because we see it throughout the New Testament. Did you know, by the way, that Back in the earlier part of the 20th century, they taught in Bible schools even that the, I mean, this is what I heard. They taught in Bible schools even that the book of Enoch was a forgery that was, uh, it was a, it was a for it was a forgery that was, that was uh, made in the second to fourth, second, third or fourth century A.D., that someone in the 2nd, 3rd, 4th century A.D., because they looked, they looked at all the rest of the New Testament and they kind of pieced it all together and they pieced together the rest of the stuff in the Bible and they, and they, and they made their own forgery. Book of Enoch was just a forgery. It wasn't the, it wasn't the real deal. It was, just, it was just a lie. It was just a forgery. They taught that in Bible schools for the first half of this, the 20th century. And then, I mean, let me let me let me say this again. I mean, I just want to say, everybody assumed and and was taught in many in many circles that the Book of Enoch was written two to four hundred years after the time of Christ, because of how much it coincided with what Jesus said, how much it had a lot of the sayings of Jesus in it. So they thought, oh, I, I, we see what happened here. Someone took it and. Because, you know, that's the only thing they knew about is that the book of Enoch must have been forged after the fact. But then they found the Dead Sea Scrolls and the whole world changed then. Then they dated the book of Enoch, which was in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The book of Enoch was found in the Dead Sea Scrolls. They dated that as two to 400 B.C. Whoops. We were out like four to 800 years here. I would say you're out even more. If you think that the book of Enoch was written two to 400 BC, you're wrong. I would say that that copy that you found in the, in the Dead Sea Scrolls was probably written in that time. Sure. I mean, it was copied at that time. So that really, for those of you who really use your brains... <laughs> That means that much of the New Testament, what it says, lined up and was taken in many places verbatim out of the book of Enoch that that existed in those days. If if today I said, well, you know what, if I wrote wrote uh, an article and in that article I said to be or not to be, or if I talked about Romeo and Juliet and, you know, Romeo, Romeo, where where art thou, Romeo? I wouldn't have to mention any names or any references. Everybody would know what I'm, what I'm referencing, what I'm talking about, what I'm, what I'm quoting, what I'm repeating in the same way in in those days, everybody knew. When Jesus used the word, the term son of man, the elect, the right hand of the power, the coming of the clouds and the sky, all these, all this stuff and many, many more. They knew what he was saying. That's why the high priest tore his clothes. They knew that he was saying, that Yeshua was saying that he was the Messiah that was prophesied of 
from the book of Enoch. That's why a Torah is close. He has, you know, he has spoken blasphemy. You say you're, you're the Mashiach, the Son of God? Why do we need any more witnesses? Behold, now you have heard his, this, his blasphemy. What do you think? They answered, he's worthy of death. And they spat in his face and beat him with their fists. And some slapped him, saying, prophesy to us, Mashiach, who hit you? Now Peter was sitting outside in the court. And a maid came to him, saying, you were also with Yeshua the Galilean. But he denied it before them all. And he said, I don't know what you're talking about. When he had gone out onto the porch, someone else saw him and said to those who were, with, uh, who were there, this man also was with Yeshua of Nazareth. Again, he denied it with an oath. And he said, I don't know that man. Verse 73, after a little while, while those who stood by came and said to Peter, surely you are one of them for your speech, the way you talk makes you known. I would love to know the difference between how Peter talked and how the rest of the Jewish Peter, I mean, how the rest of the people talked. The accent, the accent gives it away that you are actually a disciple of Jesus. Then he began to curse and swear and say, I don't know that man. I don't know the man. Immediately the rooster crowed. Peter remembered the word which Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. Then he went out and wept bitterly. Well, that concludes our reading of Matthew chapter 26 and I hope this was a blessing to you. This is a very awesome portion of scripture. All of the prophets longed to read what we're reading. And so, yeah, Awesome. Awesome stuff. Thanks for watching. And don't forget to stay, stay, you know, stick in there. Uh, subscribe. Check back uh, to the channel. And uh, you know, I'm always posting new stuff all the time. And we're going to be going through the scripture. We're going to be going through everything. Every single word of the Bible and every single word of the ancient documents that existed back, back in those days. The sacred text that is not included in many Bibles. Thanks again for watching. And God bless you.